right now, you should go to patreon.com slash unregistered and become a patron of this show. When you do that, you will have access to roughly half of the episodes of Unregistered. You can also see the weekly unreported news analysis show with me, regular AMAs, and you'll have access to Thursday night's unregistered live Zoom meetings with me. But at the unregistered academy level, you can take all of our courses. We already have five on the books that you can watch right now, and we have multiple live interactive webinars coming up throughout the summer. So again, go to patreon.com slash unregistered and become a patron right now. I'll see you in class. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Larry Flint was a pornographer, a maniac, a madman, and the greatest champion of free speech we have ever known. This is my interview with his cinematic biographer, Nadia Soul. I am joined from one of my favorite places on earth, which is Ojai, California, um, by Nadia Zold, who is a a brilliant filmmaker who has a film called uh, Larry Larry Flint for President, uh, which is a film about, of course, Larry Flint. And I encountered you, as I just told you before we started recording, in the strangest way. I, I saw you on Steve Bannon's War Room, and I thought, why on earth is this person on Steve Bannon's War Room talking about Larry Flint and the Supreme Court case? involving Jerry Falwell, which really established the, the speech regime, speech rights regime that media is now operating under. But it just made no sense. And so I, I was fascinated by you and the film and I reached out to you and turns out, yeah, you're not a, you're not a Trump supporter MAGA type. And there was a very strange story as, as to how you got onto the war room, which I don't think we need to, I guess we can, we can recount that a bit. Why don't, yeah, why don't you first explain why on earth, how you ended up on Steve Bannon's war room being someone who, you, just told me, you know, you're not at all that kind of person politically. What's the story there? Okay, so before I got funding for Larry Flint for president, I had the idea of making a propaganda film festival in DC. Um, And we would show like old propaganda films and current propaganda films. And uh, this is when Steve Bannon was in the White House and I started watching some of his films I was like, well, these are really, really intense. Um, and then I, um, I reached out to him and he agreed to meet and he was really excited about the idea. We were, uh, the plan was to have uh, like an outdoor screening on the National Mall and then also have screenings at the Watergate Hotel. And the Watergate Hotel had said yes to this, which was great. And um, the uh, British filmmaker, Adam Curtis had, also agreed to this. Oh. And so I was like, Adam Curtis, Steve Bannon, um, Lenny <laughs> wow. Riefenstahl, <laughs> I am Cuba. Like, I was like, this is, this is gonna be great. And I, uh, so, so it didn't happen because I got funding for my film. And part of that was uh, I signed a contract saying that I wouldn't engage in any other major project and a film festival is a major project. So um, I had to go on the back burner, but the title of the festival was gonna be called Apocalyptic Picnic. 
And um, it just, it felt very apocalyptic during that time Mm -hmm. uh, of like 2017, Mm -hmm. Trump's first year. So Mm -hmm. um, that's how I met Bannon. And then I recently had a screening in DC and invited him to the film. And, uh, and then they invited me on the show. And of course I I wanted to be on the show. I, I, I've never watched the war room, but I, um, I was just excited to talk Larry Flint and, um, freedom of speech (laughs) with, um, Stephen K. Bannon. Well, this is because they, the Republicans and especially MAGA people these days are very concerned about free speech. They didn't, they didn't used to be. Um, <laughs> and now they're very concerned about free speech because they're getting, you know, the business end of the censorship Platform. stick. Yeah. So I think that's why they had you on. Um, but they are, I think they're going to censor the hell out of us if they take power. I am, I'm quite uh, nervous about MAGA taking power in this country because of that in particular. I think they might come after me. And maybe, you yeah, too. I think that, um, I mean, the I, I was interested in, in making the film because of what was going on in the country. That was directly related to why I um, chose the subject, because I felt that he was going after he, he was going after freedom of speech. He was going mm. after um, you know, the ability to critique power. So, mm. um, yeah, I don't, I don't think that it would be in good shape at all if uh, if and when <laughs> the MAGA takes over. Yeah, no, I'm on I'm on neither side in the fight between MAGA and the establishment. I'm I'm opposed to both pretty much. The um so Larry Flint, Nadia, um, we have this shared experience in a I guess in a way. So in 2010, I think it was 2010, Larry Flint reached out to me and asked me to write the foreword to his upcoming book. And I said, Well, I'll read the book. Um, and I read the book and it was Larry's dead, so I can say this. It was so terrible. I wouldn't go anywhere near that project. Um, and such a dumb thesis. It was basically about the um, the secret sex lives of American presidents and about how they were all philanderers and degenerates and perverts, et cetera. But I don't find that interesting whatsoever because it says nothing about who they were as presidents or anything. And so, but I had lunch with Larry Flint, the famous lunch at the Four Seasons. He used to hold court there every day, I think, at the, at the restaurant in the Four Seasons Hotel. And that's where he sort of did business and people would come there to have meetings with Larry Flint. That's where you went to have a meeting with Larry Flint. So I did. And, you know, here he comes with the gold plated wheelchair and two, two, I guess, bodyguards who also sort of were his caretakers who had to lift him up out of his chair every like 20 or 30 minutes, I guess, to do something with his digestive system. And, you know, Larry Flint at that time in his life, you know, it was very hard to understand him, very hard to understand him when he was talking slurred speech and the heavy Kentucky accent. And also he was he was obsessed with the Democrats, uh, well, obsessed with the Republicans being the enemy and the problem. And I was thinking, I think both parties are are your enemy. And I don't know why you're not directing your fire equally at both. But so those are all reasons I, I turned down that project. But it was a fascinating experience. I will say, I think it was a good as a solid hour of listening to him talk. I might have understood 20 percent of what he said. <laughs> but it was such it was such a surreal sort of an ultimate LA experience for me and um but that was it that was my Larry Flint experience and then and then I have been sort of interested in him politically and in Hustler politically ever since Laura Kipnis wrote this great essay about Hustler the working class politics of Hustler and how it was really a sort of an anti-elitist working class cultural expression and I thought she was dead right and Laura was on my show a long time ago to talk about that in part so yeah that's that's my Larry Flint stuff i have a lot more to say and you do too and so does the film so i want to start by asking you what you what you think the thesis of the film is what's the what's the point you're trying to make or maybe it's multiple points i mean there there are multiple points but i would say um the most important point that i'm trying to make is more um I, I, I just want to affect the viewer in a way that just like rouses them out of their comfort zone and also gives them a little bit of like a shot of confidence for being able to um, to, to say things and that potentially will offend people mm. and not be that afraid of it. I mean, life is long. 
there is such a thing as forgiveness and people make mistakes. But I think that when you start to self-censor, you know, your thoughts, um, it, we're, we're, we get into a very like dangerous place. And so Larry's um, like punk attitude and his like irreverence and his just desire to rattle people and to, to say what was in on his mind, but then also to really aim to like offend everybody. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that that's, I, I think that there's something, um, there's like a lesson there, especially in this like very uptight, like well-documented age that we're in where people are afraid of any misstep leading them to being canceled, leading them to, you know, professional ruin. So, and the stakes are so high that it makes people, I, I feel like it's, it's, it's making people like toe the line in a way that um, isn't going to, it's not, it's not productive to the advancement of, um, of like intellectual inquiry and, um, and, and, and cultural uh, renaissance. I mean, we're, we're really like in, in a dangerous place right now. And I think that it's like the risk takers who are able to, um, to push culture um, in new directions. I don't know about forward or back, but also but just like move, move it fearlessly. So if people get a little bit of um, just like a shot of, uh, of courage from it, that that's, I would say, the intention of the film. Amen. Um, Nadia, I have to say, I hope you believe that what you just said. And, and I'm going to test you. I'm going to see if you actually believe that or, or to what extent you believe that. 